Within this module, we will explore EMS systems in general. Once completed with this module, you should be able to identify the components of an EMS system, describe the EMS chain of survival, define various types of EMS services, discuss the relationship between EMS and the state trauma system, and discuss the role of the EMS physician. If you think back to the History of EMS module, the Emergency Medical Services Systems Act of 1973 defined 15 components inherent within any EMS system. Staffing is the first component. EMS systems must include an adequate number of health professions, allied health professionals, and other healthcare personnel with appropriate training and experience. The second component is education and training. EMS systems must provide for their personnel appropriate training, including clinical training, and continuing education programs which are coordinated with other programs in the system service area that provide similar training and education and emphasize recruitment and necessary training of veterans of the armed forces with military training and experience in healthcare fields and of appropriate public safety personnel in such areas. Within the current environment of EMS, this component has been further modified and updated by the National EMS Education Agenda for the Future, a systems approach document, along with the National EMS Scope of Practice Model, the National EMS Education Standards, National EMS Education Program Accreditation, and National EMS Certification. Communications is the third consideration. EMS systems must join the personnel, facilities, and equipment of the system by a central communication system so that requests for emergency health care services will be handled by a communications facility that utilizes emergency medical telephonic screening, utilizes or, within such period as the Secretary prescribes, will utilize the Universal Emergency Telephone Number 911, and will have direct communication connections and interconnections with the personnel, facilities, and equipment of the system and with other appropriate EMS systems. Fourth, EMS systems must include an adequate number of necessary ground, air, and water vehicles and other transportation facilities to meet the individual characteristics of the system service area. These vehicles and transportation facilities must meet appropriate standards relating to location, design, performance, and equipment, and the operators and other personnel for these vehicles and transportation facilities meet appropriate training and experience requirements. The fifth component states that EMS systems must include an adequate number of easily accessible EMS facilities that are collectively capable of providing services on a continuous basis, have appropriate non-duplicative and categorized capabilities, meet appropriate standards relating to capacity, location, personnel, and equipment, and are coordinated with other healthcare facilities of the system. Sixth, EMS systems must provide access, including appropriate transportation, to specialized critical medical care units in the system service area, or, if there are no such units or an inadequate number of them in such area, provide access to such units in neighboring areas if access to such units is feasible in terms of time and distance. EMS systems must provide for the effective utilization of the appropriate personnel, facilities, and equipment of each public safety agency providing emergency services in the system service area. The eighth component, consumer participation, stipulates that EMS systems be organized in a manner that provides persons who reside in the system service area and who have no professional training or financial interest in the provision of health care with an adequate opportunity to participate in the making of policy for the system. Component number nine is accessibility of care. EMS systems must provide, without prior inquiry as to the ability to pay, necessary emergency medical services to all patients requiring such services. Next is the requirement that EMS systems provide for the transfer of patients to facilities and programs that offer such follow-up care and rehabilitation as is necessary to affect the maximum recovery of the patient. This requires the EMS system to integrate with other professionals to ensure continuity of care for patients such as medical personnel, law enforcement, emergency management, home health care providers, and other responders, to name a few. Component 11 addresses record keeping. EMS systems shall provide for a standardized patient record keeping system meeting appropriate standards established by the Secretary. The records shall cover the treatment of the patient from initial entry into the system through his or her discharge from it.
The records must also be consistent with ensuing patient records used in follow-up care and rehabilitation of the patient. Public education is the crux of Component 12. EMS systems must provide programs of public education and information in the system service area, taking into account the needs of visitors to, as well as residents of, that area to know or be able to learn immediately the means of obtaining emergency medical services. These programs must stress the general dissemination of information regarding appropriate methods of medical self-help and first aid, and regarding the availability of first aid training programs in the area. The component is now recognized to touch upon two specific populations, patients within the EMS system and the public at large. As far as the patients are concerned, EMS systems should provide education for prevention purposes before the patient experiences an incident. This could entail education on the use of seat belts, bicycle helmets, fall prevention efforts for the elderly, and so on. Once a patient is treated by EMS, post-incident education could include medication compliance, signs and symptoms of future similar medical emergencies, access to community services, and other information as pertinent to the specific patient and his or her ailment. From the public education standpoint, EMS systems must role model behaviors for the public. Community involvement is also important, as is participation in community and prevention activities. If necessary, EMS systems may need to take the lead in organizing public education activities related to community members' safety, health, and well-being. Component 13 requires EMS systems to provide for periodic, comprehensive, and independent review and evaluation of the extent and quality of the emergency health care services provided in the system service area and submission to the Secretary of the reports of each such review and evaluation. Disaster planning is the focus of Component 14 as EMS services must have a plan to assure that the system will be capable of providing emergency medical services in the system service area during mass casualties, natural disasters, or national emergencies. Lastly, Component 15 requires EMS systems to provide for the establishment of appropriate arrangements with emergency medical services systems or similar entities serving neighboring areas for the provision of emergency medical services on a reciprocal basis where access to such services would be more appropriate and effective in terms of the services available, time, and distance. Arguably, our American society is not the same as it was in 1973, and EMS has evolved considerably since that time in the passage of the EMS Systems Act of 1973. Keep in mind as well that the 15 components of an EMS system were identified as part of an act that was designed to provide grant funding to support the development of EMS systems. The purpose of the act was arguably not to define EMS in and of itself, but to provide money to support the states and other stakeholders in developing EMS systems. Thus, the 15 components defined in 1973 may not be adequate to define everything EMS does today. One such criticism of the 15 components is that medical direction and physician involvement is not mentioned anywhere. Additionally, the importance of research and evidence-based decision-making in EMS is glaringly absent. While staffing was a component defined within the EMS Systems Act, the Act failed to recognize that EMS systems have a responsibility to those EMS providers to maintain a safe and healthy workplace for their personnel. Another shortcoming of the 15 components is that it fails to recognize the importance of maintaining fiscal accountability and solvency. Today's environment has seen soaring health care costs, inconsistent access to health care services, especially for those of lower socioeconomic means, and a decrease in volunteerism, which has negatively impacted the ability of EMS services to function without having to hire personnel that they may not be able to afford. Can you think of other components of EMS that are critical to effective functioning of an EMS system that may have been excluded from the EMS Systems Act of 1973 or have developed over time to become required components in modern-day EMS systems? If so, feel free to add them to the list and keep them in mind when you defined EMS to family, friends, the public, and other stakeholders in your local EMS system. When evaluating an EMS system, it is important to keep in mind the EMS chain of survival. As with any chain, the EMS chain of survival is only as strong as its weakest link and it begins even before the EMS system is activated. When someone experiences a medical or traumatic emergency, bystander care can be critical for a positive outcome. 
The best example is an individual who suffers a cardiac arrest. According to a 2015 Institute of Medicine report, the likelihood of surviving a sudden cardiac arrest decreases by 10% with every passing minute. The importance of including bystander care within the EMS chain of survival is that the Institute of Medicine report also recognized that less than 3% of the population in the United States receives CPR training on an annual basis. Four out of every five cardiac arrests occur in the home and 46% are witnessed. Without addressing the community need for first aid training, including CPR, an EMS system is missing a large population of potential emergency responders who could make a difference in those critical minutes before credentialed EMS providers arrive on the scene. As opposed to the initial years of EMS in the 60s and 70s, activating the EMS system is not as challenging as it once was, with the Pew Research Center reporting in 2018 that 95% of Americans own a cell phone of some kind. Furthermore, as of December 2017, the National Emergency Number Association reported that 98.9% .9 of the U.S. population was covered by wireless 911 access. Once a public safety access point is notified of an emergency, dispatch effectiveness becomes the next critical piece of the chain of survival. EMS must be dispatched quickly to the correct location. The incorporation of emergency medical dispatch, priority dispatch, and pre-arrival instructions to bystanders can all play a significant role in patient survivability and system efficiency. Having those emergency response resources located nearby is also of tremendous benefit as the response time to a patient requiring help can have a substantial impact on the outcome. Strategically locating EMS stations within a community, having the ability to dispatch the closest ambulance to an emergency call, using traffic preemption technology, and other related strategies help to reduce response times. Some areas are even looking at incorporating drones into their emergency response protocols to assist bystanders on the scene with providing first aid care until trained, credentialed EMS providers arrive on the scene. Once the EMS crew is on the scene, the quality of pre-hospital care delivered by the EMS crew is the next link in the EMS chain of survival. Effective training and education, progressive protocols, involved medical direction, a robust continuous quality improvement program, and other facets of providing emergency care in the back of the ambulance are all critical in maintaining this important link in the EMS chain of survival. Going hand-in-hand -hand with pre-hospital care is the transportation of the patient from the scene of the emergency to the hospital. Transportation should be efficient, rapid when necessary, and safe at all times. In some areas, for some calls, this may mean utilizing a helicopter to transport the patient. Given traditional ground ambulance transportation, the use of lights and siren may or may not be indicated given the circumstances. Statistics show that the use of emergency lights and siren can increase the probability of being in an accident and the time saved by driving on an emergency basis can be somewhat negligible, especially when weighed against the increased risk of being involved in a motor vehicle collision. Ensuring the correct personnel are transporting is also a consideration. This means having adequate personnel credentialed at the correct level based upon the care to be provided. A BLS crew of an EMT and a driver is not appropriate when ALS is available and you are running a code, for example. The care provided at the emergency department is the next link in the EMS chain of survival. While an EMS provider may wonder what he or she has to do with the quality and level of care provided at the hospital emergency department, that same EMS provider typically has to determine which destination hospital would best accommodate his or her patient. Driving an extra five minutes to a level one trauma center may be very appropriate for a patient with significant traumatic injuries. Some hospitals are also differentiating themselves as stroke centers, burn centers, cardiac care centers, and others may provide specialty pediatric care. All of these designations may play a part in the transport destination decisions as a patient may very well need these various specialty services once stabilized in the emergency department. If this definitive care cannot be provided by the same hospital, EMS is often called upon to provide additional interfacility transport services. Assuming the patient survives his or her medical or traumatic emergency and subsequent treatment, the last component of the EMS chain of survival is that of providing rehabilitation for the patient. 
While this is an area of the continuity of care in which EMS historically did not have much participation, that too is beginning to change with the advent of mobile integrated healthcare and community EMS. Each link in the EMS chain of survival is critical to ensuring successful and positive outcomes for patients who enter into the EMS system. When developing, maintaining, evaluating, and improving an EMS system, whether at the local or state level, each element must be considered and adequately addressed. In the early days of EMS, services were provided by funeral homes and police departments. Now, we tend to see a few different types of agencies that provide EMS across the country. In no particular order, the first type of EMS agency structure is fire-based. If you recall from the History of EMS module, fire departments such as those in Miami, Seattle, Los Angeles, and elsewhere jumped on board with EMS very early on and were integral in starting community-based, tax-supported EMS as an additional function of emergency services provided by the fire department. In 2017, the NFPA reported that there were approximately 29,727 fire departments within the United States. Of those departments, 45.4% provided BLS EMS services, 15.5% provided ALS EMS services, and the remaining 39.1% did not provide EMS. For the year prior, in 2016, the NFPA reported that almost two-thirds, 64.4% of all fire department call volume was for EMS or medical aid. By comparison, fire constituted a mere 3.8% of the 35,320,000 nationwide fire department calls for service in 2016. According to the NHTSA 2011 National EMS Assessment, approximately 40% of the nation's 21,000-plus EMS agencies are fire-based. In some municipalities, EMS services are provided by the government, but the EMS agency itself is not part of the fire department. These are referred to as third service agencies, with police and fire constituting the other two protective service agencies maintained by these municipalities. These governmental non-fire-based agencies account for approximately 21% of the EMS agencies within the United States. Hospitals are an important part of an EMS system, and some hospitals actually provide transport services themselves. These hospital-based EMS agencies account for approximately 6% of EMS providers across the country. Private EMS agencies are not directly associated with a hospital or governmental body such as a county or a municipality. Some are an integral part of 911 response systems and may provide contracted services to governmental agencies or regions, while others provide non-911 responses and transports. The two major types of private EMS agencies are defined by whether or not they are for-profit or non-profit. Behind fire-based services, private EMS agencies account for the second largest percentage of EMS organizations within the United States, with approximately one in four, 25%, of all EMS agencies being privately owned. Lastly, there are EMS agencies that do not necessarily fall into one of the predefined categories, such as tribal EMS agencies. These other agency types account for the remaining 9% of EMS organizations within the United States. Of interesting note, the NHTSA report also indicated that one-third of the states have indicated that the majority of EMS organizations that respond to 911 emergencies with transport capability are considered to be volunteer agencies. Within Wisconsin, the Emergency Medical Services Statute, Chapter 256, required in 1997 that the state develop and implement a statewide trauma care system that includes a statewide trauma advisory council and regional trauma advisory councils. Hospitals must also be classified in accordance with the American College of Surgeons standards pertaining to trauma treatment capabilities. As of 2018, the Wisconsin Department of Health Services reported that 124 out of 126 hospitals in the state were participating in the trauma care classification system. 9% were ACS verified level 1 or 2, and the remaining 91% were designated as level 3 or 4 trauma care facilities. In addition to statutory language, the Department of Health Services promulgated Administrative Rule DHS-118 Trauma Care. This rule not only provides regulatory clarification of the statutory provisions related to the state's trauma care system, but it also created the state's trauma registry system and requirement that trauma registry data be used for trauma system performance improvement. 
each EMS agency within the state must also be a member of one of the state's regional trauma advisory councils. Earlier, it was mentioned that the 15 components of an EMS system failed to recognize the importance of the EMS physician and medical direction. EMS providers essentially function under the delegated authority of a physician and are limited in what they can do by applicable state laws, regulations, scopes of practice, and medical director approved policies, procedures, and protocols. Over time, the importance of the EMS physician and the medical direction he or she provides has been validated and emphasized to the point where the following roles of the EMS physician are commonly recognized as critical to the proper and effective functioning of an EMS agency. The EMS physician is often involved in the education and training of EMS personnel. While an agency's medical director may not be actively involved in an individual's initial education at the EMR, EMT, AEMT, or paramedic levels, those educational institutions providing such education must commonly have their own medical director. If field experiences are required within that initial education, the EMS agency's medical director may be involved in permitting or reviewing those student field experiences. Beyond initial education, however, medical directors will often use service and potentially statewide data to determine areas in which service performance can be improved and use that as the foundation of developing and providing ongoing continuing training and education to the agency's EMS providers. While this can vary by agency and area, some medical directors are actively involved in the hiring process for the EMS agency and may also participate in the selection and purchasing of equipment used by the EMS agency. If training is required to use such equipment, the medical director may be involved in developing or providing that training as well. The main crux of what an EMS physician does for an EMS agency is the development of clinical protocols for the care and treatment of the sick and injured by the EMS agency's providers. To ensure these protocols are adequate and appropriate, the EMS medical director must maintain his or her own continuing education and training to stay abreast of emerging data, science, evidence, and trends within the profession of pre-hospital emergency medicine. On the back end of providing out-of-hospital emergency care, the EMS physician must also maintain active involvement in the agency's continuous quality improvement process and should also participate in resolving problems that may arise in a pre-hospital patient care setting. As such, the EMS physician routinely provides direct input into patient care. In addition to these duties, the EMS physician often serves as an intermediary between the EMS agency's providers and other health care agencies. He or she serves as an advocate within the medical community for EMS in general, as well as the agency or agencies he or she represents. Lastly, the EMS physician must be ever diligent to serve as the medical conscience of the EMS system and routinely advocate for the patients and the need for quality patient care. As far as direct patient care is concerned, EMS providers act as an extension of their respective agency's EMS physician. In accomplishing this task, the EMS providers function under two different types of medical direction. The first is offline or indirect medical direction. As mentioned in the last slide, EMS physicians must provide oversight in all facets of pre-hospital patient care, which includes the generation and maintenance of medical protocols to be followed by the EMS providers as appropriate given the patient's signs, symptoms, complaints, presentation, and circumstances. These offline or standing orders prescribe possible treatments to be administered by the EMS providers given the patient's unique and underlying health care issue or issues. Is the patient experiencing chest pain, breathing difficulty, an allergic reaction, or a traumatic injury to an extremity? The EMS agency should have protocols in place that define how such a patient is to be treated in such various scenarios. Such protocols are called offline medical direction because the EMS providers do not need to speak with the EMS physician in order to provide the treatment called for within the protocol. Rather, the protocols are standing orders that may be applied at any time without specific approval by the EMS physician if the criteria defined within the protocol are met. Did the patient suffer a long bone fracture with obvious deformity? There should be no need for the EMS crew to call medical control for permission to apply a splint so long as there is a protocol or standing order in place that allows it. In some cases, however, the patient's condition or response to treatment does not readily fit into a predefined scenario that complies with a standing order or protocol. 
Maybe the patient is experiencing a multi-system issue, has unique health care issues or challenges, or the treatment provided by following offline medical control up to this point has been ineffective. In such cases, the EMS providers must have the availability of contacting online medical control whereby the EMS provider can communicate with an EMS physician and receive orders as to how additional care and treatment should be provided to the patient. Because EMS agencies never know when they will be providing services, it is not uncommon to obtain online medical direction from a local hospital emergency department or some other similar resource that is available 24 hours per day, 7 days a week. Offline medical direction provides some significant benefits when compared to online medical direction. The first is that agencies have an opportunity to develop protocols and provide training on them proactively before a call comes in. This helps ensure the providers are adequately prepared to handle various common or routine patient presentations and scenarios in the pre-hospital setting without the need to contact medical control for guidance or permission. The result is a more cohesive and rapid response to the patient's emergency. Consider for a moment a call for a pulseless non-breather. Requiring the EMS crew to physically call medical control for permission to begin CPR or directions on how to perform CPR would completely undermine the reason we have trained EMS practitioners in the first place. Remember as well that EMS scenes can be anywhere and it is not reasonable for an EMS provider to wait to provide treatment to a patient who desperately needs it because a phone is not available, there is no cell service in the area, or the portable radio is in a dead spot. Retrospectively, the EMS physician can also review the results and documentation of the EMS run in light of the protocols or standing orders that were followed to determine crew compliance with the protocol or standing order in addition to assessing the effectiveness of the protocol or standing order itself. The protocol or standing order provides a baseline for evaluation and, if changes need to be made, the medical director can start with the existing protocol or standing order and modify as necessary to hopefully improve patient outcomes in the future. With that in mind, the major shortcoming of offline medical direction is the greatest strength of online medical direction. As previously mentioned, some patient presentations simply do not fit within the black and white algorithms commonly contained within a standing order or offline protocol. There are also cases where the treatment provided in compliance with a standing order or protocol proves to be inadequate or ineffective. EMS providers receive significant education and training to do what they do, but there are shortcomings to the education in that an EMS provider is not a physician. As a result, the EMS provider's knowledge of medicine is admittedly limited, especially compared to a physician who completed medical school, subsequent residency, and may have obtained credentialing in emergency medicine as a specialty. The practice of medicine can be just as much art as science on occasion, and some patient presentations are simply befuddling. Online medical direction gives the EMS practitioner access to a live physician who can assist in troubleshooting the patient's condition while developing a treatment plan that may not comply with any established protocols or standing orders. The online EMS physician can also modify protocols and standing orders for the benefit of the patient. As an example, a standing order may call for the administration of 4 mg of morphine to control pain, yet the patient indicated there has been no pain relief after the medication was administered. The online EMS physician providing medical control for the EMS providers could order an additional 4 mg of morphine be administered for a total of 8 mg within a short period of time, even if the standing order caps the administration of morphine at 4 mg. By modifying or abandoning a protocol or standing order, the online medical control physician can work with the on-scene EMS providers to better treat the patient in the hopes of achieving a better outcome for that patient. When taken together, both offline and online medical direction work together to ensure rapid, efficient, and effective patient care in the pre-hospital setting. That wraps up this module on EMS systems. Having completed this presentation, you should now be able to identify the components of an EMS system, describe the EMS chain of survival, define various types of EMS services, discuss the relationship between EMS and the state trauma system, and discuss the role of the EMS physician. This presentation was prepared by Waukesha County Technical College in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, and is distributed with an attribution, non-commercial, share-alike 4.0 International Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, Waukesha County Technical College. For information on WCTC's numerous fire and EMS educational offerings, please visit us online at wctc.edu.